Well, if you're just joining us, uh, my name's Chris. I'm the pastor here. So glad you're here. We are in week two of a s- series we started last week that's going to carry us all the way through the summer, and it's called Stories with Substance. Uh, what we're doing is looking at the parables of Jesus. So Jesus uh, was a- an incredible teacher, and one of the ways that he often taught us in, in ways that would stick was through these, these stories that we call parables. And so Jesus would, would take an example or an illustration from everyday life that, that people in his world and his context could understand, and then he would teach a, a deeper truth about the kingdom of God through these stories, hence the title, Stories with Substance. So last week we began uh, this parable series, and, and if you're also just jumping in with us, all year long we're just, we're just looking at the life and teachings of Jesus. That's, that's the theme. It's just all about Jesus all year. So we, we looked at encounters with Jesus for the first uh, uh, third of the year, and then we're going to be looking at the parables of Jesus now through the summer. And then in the fall, we're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' most famous teaching. Um, but last week, we started by looking at the parabolic discourse, which is found in Matthew chapter 13. It's one of uh, five major discourses, five major teaching blocks of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. And we started with the very first parable in that teaching block. And today we're going to go back to Matthew uh, 13 again. So if you have your Bibles, it's the passage we just read, but I want to encourage you to open them up and, and to, to be reading along with me and studying, highlighting, marking it up. Even if you have an electronic Bible, that's a great tool. You can highlight, you can underline, you can mark it, you can make notes. Uh, but we want you to be able to take this home with you and have it stick with you. And so um, we're looking at these two parables today that Jesus told back to back. It's only three verses today, which you're probably thinking means you're going to get out of here a little early today. Uh, but you are mistaken. Uh, this is city church. That doesn't happen around here. You don't get out of here early. That's all right, though. We've got a lot to unpack in these few short verses, and we're going to finish with a, a, just a powerful time to respond to uh, what Jesus is teaching us through these, these parables. So he tells two of these parables in tandem. Um, let me read them again. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found, uh, or when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So Jesus tells these two parables. They're very similar. He tells them in tandem. And anytime Jesus says the same thing twice, he's trying to get your attention. He wants you to pay attention. He wants you to listen up. And so he tells basically two very similar stories. They change a little bit in case you missed the first one or in case you didn't connect with the first one. Hopefully you'll connect with the second one. But both are trying to get at the same point here. These parables are about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. When Jesus shows up on the scene, he begins his teaching, his messages by saying, the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is near. And so let me, let me just help us orient ourselves really quickly here. When you and I think about the kingdom of heaven, sometimes because of, of what, what culture has even done with the truth of Scripture, we, we tend to think of heaven as some sort of disembodied, distant place somewhere other than this world. But can I remind you that when, when we say Jesus is coming back, we mean here. Jesus is coming back to earth one day. There will be a new, restored, new heaven, new earth all together in one place. And Jesus, when he showed up on the scene, he said the kingdom of heaven is near, meaning that begins now. So he began right away to usher in the kingdom of heaven. And and he was letting everybody know it's not far off. It's not some far off removed place. The kingdom of heaven has arrived because Jesus has arrived. And so let me say it like this. Wherever the king is, that's where the kingdom will be. And Jesus is king, and so he arrived and he began to usher in his kingdom, and he is still king to this day. And so therefore, he teaches them these parables about the kingdom of heaven, helping them to understand how valuable the kingdom of heaven is. And also, I'll just say it like this, every single one of us, we belong to a kingdom. There is no such thing as a neutral party when it comes to the spiritual realm. All of us belong to a kingdom, either the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of hell, either the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. And Jesus is trying to take people from the kingdom of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of light. That's why he came. And so he's speaking about the value, the worth of the kingdom of heaven. In the very first parable, he says it's like a treasure hidden in a field. So uh, what you may not know is treasure... Uh, in that day, in the first century world, specifically in that part of the world, 
was often hidden in, in caves or in fields. You would bury it underground because in their day, there was no such thing as a, as a bank as you and I know it. So they had banks, but they were just money exchangers. It wasn't a place for you to really uh, save up or store up your treasure, and, and they weren't very reliable. And also, it was a part of the world where it was always just very tumultuous. War was breaking out all the time. People were invading all the time. And, and still to this day, that's, that's what's happening in that world. I don't know if you've watched the news at all in the last six months, but that's still happening in, in that part of the world still to this day. And so when people had treasure, the safest place for it was to go find a cave or a hole or, or to find a field and dig a hole and bury it in the ground. And so Jesus says there's this treasure hidden in a field. He said there's this man who finds this treasure. He hides it again. And then with great joy, watch that, with great joy, sold all that he had to buy the field. So this man finds this treasure and, and clearly he says, this is worth more than everything else that I have. So much so that I'm going to go sell everything that I have. It's going to cost me everything. I'm going to sell everything I have. But with great joy, I am gl glad to do this. I am happy to sell and, and get rid of and surrender and sacrifice everything else that I have in order to gain this treasure that's in this field. That's the kingdom of God. Or in the second parable, it's a merchant. So this man would have probably been a little more well-off, more well-established. And he's searching for fine pearls. So he knows what he's looking for. Again, in that time period, a, a pearl, a rare pearl, would have been more valuable than a rare diamond. It would have been arguably the most valuable item that you could find on earth. And so that's what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to draw them in and say, the kingdom of heaven is far more valuable than anything else that this world has to offer. So much so that this man went and, and sold everything he had. When he found one of great value, he sold everything he had in order to buy it. So this man, he was wealthy, he was well off, and it still cost him everything. Whether you're rich or you're poor, no matter where you come from, in order to inherit the kingdom of God, it's going to cost you all that you have. All Jesus wants is all you have. Nothing more, nothing less. So both parables tell the story of a person that's looking for something of great value or maybe stumbling upon something of great value, finding it, and then again with great joy selling all that they have in order to gain what they found. Now, historically, there have been two primary ways that this parable has been interpreted throughout church history. So scholars and Bible teachers and pastors and preachers and church leaders throughout the centuries, there have been two primary ways that this parable has been interpreted. And, and I, I'll give you my honest opinion. I think both are true. I don't think this is an either or when it comes to the interpretation of these parables. I think it's a both and. And so I'm going to teach you both of the interpretations that, that you know, a faithful, historic Christian belief has, has understood these parables to mean. And so the first way is to look at the parable from the vantage point of the man or the merchant. Essentially saying like, this, this is us. Like Jesus is trying to say, hey, this is you. Or, or at least it could be you. Or, or I hope it's you. That, that we would identify as the man in the field or as the merchant looking for the parable or uh, for the, for the um, pearl. And so there, there are kind of three things that we can find if we interpret the parable that way. The first one is this, that, that we would be looking for the kingdom of God. Like if we're identifying as the man in the field or as the merchant, it means that we're looking for the kingdom of God. It means that there's some, some level of hunger, some level of desire, some level of like, man, I, I, I don't have what I, what I need. And even though maybe I have other things, I'm still missing the greatest thing. And so I'm out looking for it. Or at least that when we stumble upon it, like sometimes God will bring things our way we're not even looking for, but when we stumble upon it, that we would realize what an incredible gift this is. And so there would just be this, this hunger, this, this desire that we would be looking for the kingdom of God. Again, in Mark 1, verse 15, Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come near. It's near. So can I just remind all of us in the room, the kingdom of God is still near. It's around us all of the time. If, when you give your life to Christ, one of the, one of the fatal flaws of the, the American Western church over the last 50 to 100 years is, is simply selling this version of the gospel that says, you just need to pray a prayer, 
give your life to Christ, and then just go on, live your life for the rest of your life and hope and wait for the day that you die so that then you can experience the kingdom of God. I don't see that in the scriptures. I don't see it. What I see is that Jesus says, no, 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 the kingdom of God is all around us. We just have to have eyes to see. We have to be willing to open our eyes, to open our hearts, to to actually see the kingdom of God. In Matthew 13, 13, we talked about this last week. This was the first parable. Jesus quoted Isaiah. He said, though seeing, they do not see. And so this is why so many of us don't recognize the kingdom of God is all around us. Is We have eyes, but we just don't see. We're not actually looking for it. We're so busy going through our lives just trying to get through our day that we miss out on the kingdom of God that is all around us. Or it's because we're expecting, expecting the kingdom to look one way and it actually looks something very different. And so, so we're not ready for it. We're not prepared for it. Jeremiah 29, 13. He says, you will seek me. This is God. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Can I remind you, brothers and sisters, this is a promise, a promise from God that you will seek him and you will find him when you seek him with all of your heart. This isn't a maybe. This isn't a possibly. This is a promise from God. If you will seek him, you will find him when you seek him with all of your heart. So that's the first thing is that we have to be looking for the kingdom of God. If we're, if we're going to find it like this, this man in the field or this, this merchant with the pearl, then we have to be looking for the kingdom of God. The second thing is that we, when we find it, we would actually understand what we found. We would understand its worth. See, there, there are a lot of people who've heard the gospel and just haven't recognized its value, haven't recognized its worth. We talked about this last week with the parable of the sower and the seeds. There are some people who are simply going to reject the gospel because they, they don't understand what it's actually worth. They don't understand its actual value. And so it's not just finding it, but then it's having an understanding of how incredible the kingdom of God really is. That we would see and understand its worth. And so that's why Jesus tells the story of this man who, who finds a treasure hidden in a field. And, and therefore he goes and sells everything because he realizes this is far more valuable than anything this man has. And so it's worth it for him to lose everything else in order to gain this treasure. So several years ago, there was this painting by Leonardo da Vinci called the Salvatore Mundi. The Salvatore Mundi. And this painting set a record for being the most expensive painting ever sold in in recorded human history. And it sold for $450 million dollars. $450 $450 million. Now, I, I thought about showing you a picture of this, this painting, um, but I decided against it, and here's why. You can go look it up for yourself if you want. You can go learn about it, but it's a painting by Leonardo da Vinci. He was a product of his time, and he painted this picture of Jesus, but it was white Jesus with kind of like the blonde, flowing hair, curly hair Jesus. And here's the reality. That's not what Jesus looked like. Jesus wasn't a white guy. So I'm just like, I just have no desire to show you a picture of somebody that's supposed to be Jesus that doesn't look anything like Jesus. But you can go look that up on your own some other time. That's not the point of the story. The point is this. I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you were in the housing market right now looking to purchase a home. Rough right now. Okay, can we just all acknowledge? Like, not a good time to be buying a house these days. And so interest rates are high. The prices of homes continue to climb. It's a difficult time to buy a home. So I want you to imagine that you stumble upon a house that's at the very top of your budget. And this house is rough. Like it needs work in every area of the house. It's going to need a whole lot of investment. It's going to be a massive labor of love. And it's at the very top of your budget. It's going to cost you everything you have and more. Now, I get it that for some of you, you're like, I don't know. I don't know if this is the time to buy that house. But now imagine with me that you went down into the basement of that house, and it's a, a basement kind of like all the, the basements in my neighborhood. Creepy. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't want to hang out down there. Imagine you went down to that basement, and you found the Salvatore Mundi. And you knew what it was. And you knew how valuable it was. And imagine you went up, and you, you talked to the homeowner, and you said, do you know what you have in your basement? And they said, no, I, I don't care. I don't want it, 
and it stays with the house. And you try to talk some sense into them and they won't listen. They say, whoever buys the house gets everything. What would you do? Sold today. Sold. Some of y'all would go, you know, sell your kid in order to buy that house. You do whatever it takes. You're going to go rob a bank in order to buy the house if you need to. You will do whatever it takes to get that house. It's not because of the house. It's because of what's found in the house. It's the treasure in the house. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to get at here. It's, it's the value of the kingdom of God. It's, it's worth far more than anything. And, and so if you bought that house, you would not talk about the sacrifices that you had to make. None of us would. None of us would talk about all the sacrifices that we had to go sell, all of our, all the other stuff that we had, our cars, all of our other personal belongings. We had to get rid of everything else we had in order to acquire this house. The reason why is because it wouldn't be a sacrifice. Because what you're gaining is far greater than what you're losing. And in today's market, a painting worth $450 million, that's probably enough to buy three or four houses. So that's a, that's a joke, okay? I'm not, hopefully we don't get that bad. So that's the second thing. The first is that we would be looking for the kingdom of God. The second is that when we, the, you see this in both stories. He's saying the same thing twice, trying to get your attention. Looking for the kingdom of God. When we find it, we would understand its worth. And then three, with great joy. With great joy, we would sell everything we have. We would trade everything we have. We would surrender everything we have for the kingdom of God. That we would, with, with gladness, recognize what we're, what we're gaining is far greater than anything that we're ever going to lose. In Matthew 16, verse 24, just, just a few chapters later, Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple. So I want to pause here for a second. If you are somebody who's considering becoming a disciple of Jesus, if you're somebody who's curious about what it means to give your life to Christ, if you're somebody who's interested in the kingdom of God and receiving this free gift of salvation, this is the invitation of Jesus. I have no desire to water down the gospel for anyone. I just want you to hear it plainly from him. Whoever wants to be my disciple, Jesus says, must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. That's the invitation of Jesus. That's what he's calling all of us into. It's a willingness to surrender everything. It's, a, it's, this, it's this willingness to say, make me a vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be because my life now belongs to you. That, that's the invitation of Jesus, that with great joy we would trade it all, all that the world has to offer. What good does it? Anyone. To gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul. This is the invitation of Jesus. And so again, historically, there are two ways to interpret this parable. The first way is to look through the lens of the, uh, the man in the field or the merchant and to say, I, I want that to be me. And listen, that's my heart and, and my, my hope and my prayer, and my heart's desire for each and every one of us in this place is that we would say, I, I want that to be me. And listen, you can't do that on your own. That you are going to need the help of the Holy Spirit to lead you daily to that place of surrender. But that is the, the first uh, way that, that historically we have interpreted this parable. The second way, there is another way to look at this parable. And again, I, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. And it's to look at this story not as if you and I are the man in the field or the merchant. But it's to look at this story as if Jesus was talking about himself. That he is the man in the field. That Jesus is the merchant. And, and so I'm going to read it to you again. And I want you to think about the, these parables through the lens of Jesus being the man or Jesus being the merchant. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it. He hid it again and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. See, through this interpretation, 
Jesus is the man. Jesus is the merchant. And you are the treasure. You are the pearl. And so just, just stick with me here for a moment. Jesus came down to earth, took on flesh and blood, became human like you and me. This is the perfect, sinless son of God. And he came and found us when we weren't looking for him. He came and found us. And, and not only did he find us, but actually he, he dug us up out of the dirt because you and I, we were buried in our sin. We were dead in our sin and in our shame. And Jesus came and he found us. He dug us up out of, out of the ground and said, no, no, I'm going to breathe new life into you. And when nobody else saw any value in us, Jesus saw endless value. He saw e eternal worth. And he said, you are worth enough that I'm, I'm going to sell everything. I'm going to give everything. I'm going to pay the ultimate price for you and for me. You see, the, the way that we determine something's worth is simply by the price that someone's willing to pay for it. That's how you determine what anything is worth. By the price somebody's willing to pay for it. So, so it's not the price tag that you put on the item. It's, it's the check that somebody writes. You see, I, I could have told you all day long that there's a painting by Leonardo da Vinci and that it's worth an estimated $450 million according to all the experts. But it's not actually worth $450 million until somebody writes a check and says, no, I'm gonna pay $450 million for that painting. And so Jesus didn't just say, you are incredibly valuable to me. He said, no, no, I'm, I'm gonna pay the ultimate price. You and I, we were bought at a price, brothers and sisters. We were bought at a price. Ephesians verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 10 says this, For we are God's handiwork. And that, that word there, handiwork, in some translations it will say workmanship, and in others it will even say masterpiece. That's the New Living Translation. We are God's masterpiece. We are his workmanship. We are, are his handiwork. What this, this word is getting at here is that God is a creator. I don't know if you recognize this or not, but God's an artist. And he, he's the first artist. He is the original artist, and he's the greatest artist. And God created you and me. And out of all the things that he created, he said, you are my very best work. You are my masterpiece. You are worth more than anything else in Everything else that I've ever created, you are God's handiwork, you are his workmanship, you are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God, God created you. He said, you are my very best work, you are my masterpiece. And then you and I, we, we sold ourselves into the slavery of sin. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, the wages of sin is death. So the price tag. For you and me is death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, I, I love this text, and I've heard many sermons on Romans chapter 6. I've heard many sermons on Romans 6.23 specifically. And oftentimes when I hear a sermon on this text, there will be a strong emphasis on, on the penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death, that you and I, yes, we deserve death. And, and don't get me wrong, I believe that wholeheartedly. The wages of sin is death, it's clear. But don't remove that. Don't separate that. Don't detach that from the hope of the gospel. The wages of sin is death, and Jesus paid the wage. He took care of it. He's already paid the price so that you and I don't have to die for our sin. He died for our sin. He said, you are worth enough that I'll give my life for you. That's how valuable you and I are to Jesus. We are like a treasure hidden in a field. That when he found us, when we couldn't find him, he found us. And he sold all that he had. He gave up everything to buy that field. We are, we are like the merchant. He, was, he is like the merchant looking for the fine pearls. And when he found us, he sold everything and he bought it. This is the, the good news of the gospel. This is the good news of the kingdom of heaven. And again, it's not an either or. It is a both and. The kingdom of heaven is worth all that you have because Jesus gave all that he had for you and for me. And so, so here's how I want to finish our time today. I want to share a practical 
real life in real time example of how this parable or these parables have played out in our midst. Because again, the kingdom of heaven is near. It's all around us. It, it, it's, it's just showing up in places and in ways that you and I would least expect it. And so a week ago Thursday, our worship team was having a rehearsal here in this room. For those of you who don't know, uh, for the last seven plus years, every Thursday night, our worship team would meet to rehearse for Sunday morning. But when you don't own your own building, you've got a lot of limitations when it comes to the space that you're going to rehearse in. And so they would actually meet in a basement classroom of our previous location, and they would rehearse in there and then translate the rehearsal from that room to then the the Sunday morning gathering. And it was really mind-blowing to me that they had that ability to even do that. And so now we are so thankful that we have a place where this team can come in on a Thursday evening and, and, and rehearse in the space, and we don't have to tear it all down. We don't have to take it all away. We don't have to have a whole bunch of you all come back in here on Sunday morning and put it all back up again so that we can have church. Praise God. We celebrate that. So again, hear me say thank you for investing. Thank you for giving to the kingdom of God through this place that we get to now use this place for ministry. But our our worship team, they were in here on Thursday night, a week ago. They were preparing for rehearsal. And they were getting things ready, getting things set up. And there's one individual on that team who occasionally could just be a little bit late. And if you know this person, you know that this is just one of their strengths is what I'll call it. So Crystal. (laughs) Love you, Crystal. Happened to show up just a few minutes late. As she pulled in the parking lot, she was the last one to, to come in, and she noticed there was this man out in the parking lot, kind of wandering through the lot and making his way toward the front doors. She didn't know the man. She didn't recognize the man. And she was trying to get out of her car and get in the building before he would meet her because she just didn't exactly know how that interaction was going to go. And as God would have it, um, she dropped her keys and couldn't get to them, couldn't reach them. They were in a difficult spot. And God just created enough delays for her that that wasn't going to happen. And so she got out of her car and she got to the front doors around the exact same time as this other man did. And as Crystal also always does, she said, come on in. Because <laughs> that's who she is. She is going to grab anyone and bring them right along. And so she invited this gentleman in and he came in and he sat in the back of the room, and it was clear that he had had a little bit too much to drink that day. And uh, a little bit disruptive, but the team up front was getting ready. They were getting things going. And so Jordan, our worship leader, was trying his best to try to navigate through that situation in a way that would be honoring, but also um, wouldn't create too much disorder in the experience that day. And so the, the gentleman started kind of shouting some things from the back about, um, in broken English, about renouncing his, his Muslim faith and, and essentially claiming that he liked Christians. He liked Christians. And so, so Jordan was trying to, trying to understand what he was saying, and so he invited him down to the front, had a brief conversation with the guy, tried to gather what he was, he was articulating, and then he invited him to just kind of hang out in the front row while the team got started. And, and there were a few more interruptions, a few more distractions that came along the way and and then finally Jordan had this moment where he he just felt like you know what I'm I'm in charge I've been tasked with this responsibility to to lead and 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 sometimes that means making the hard decision and and this this could go sideways quickly and and it's his job to to keep the team safe and so he he said you know what I'm just gonna I'm just gonna escort this guy out so he got off stage and kindly and gently said hey why don't you come out to the lobby with me and walked him out to the lobby, and he got out to that space out there. And in that moment, he was getting ready to explain to the man that he wasn't going to be able to stay that night. Uh, we don't open the building on Thursday nights for that reason. The team needs to be able to, to really be dialed in and not, not be distracted. And so he was going to explain that and then invite him to jo- join us again on a Sunday morning. And as he was preparing to explain that to this gentleman, the Holy Spirit just gave an overwhelming conviction to Jordan and, and asked him, 
why can't he stay? Why can't he stay? And, and Jordan's response, he had this back and forth that he explained to me uh, where he started to essentially argue with the Holy Spirit, which is always fun. And Jordan said, well, it's my job to keep, keep people safe, you know. I, I don't really know what's, gonna get, what's going on. He could smell the liquor on the guy's breath and, and you know, didn't really know the whole story. And so he just felt like it's, it's better to be safe than sorry. And, and so then the Holy Spirit spoke back to him and said, well, if he's safe, then why can't he stay? If he's safe, then why can't he stay? So then Jordan said, well, how, how do I know he's safe? And so then he did the only thing that he, that he knew to do, which was to, to lay hands on him and gave him a pat down. <laughs> Just being, being biblical, <laughs> laying hands on him, brother. So I'm going to give you a pat down. So the guy, and the guy let him, you know, opened his coat up, said, absolutely, you know, gave him a full pat down. I just, I've tried to visualize. I wasn't here for this, but I've tried to visualize that, that moment so many times. And, and there was nothing on the guy. And so then Jordan said, you know what, why, why don't you come back in? And, and he led him back down to the front. And then Crystal got off stage and came and sat down next to the guy and put her arm around him as she always would. And they just began to worship. And in broken English, this man just began to proclaim the name of Jesus. And just proclaim the name of Jesus. And he began weeping. And, and crying and, and leaning his head on Jordan's shoulder and, and thanking them. Just pouring out his heart to them. And worship rehearsal was very different that night. A couple different times Jordan had to even interrupt what was happening up here on stage and just, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go in a different direction. This isn't... This isn't what we expected. But, but can I just remind all of us, like, it's so easy to get caught up in doing churchy stuff that we can miss the kingdom of God in our midst. The kingdom of heaven is near. It is all around us. And so I... I'm so thankful that we have a, a worship leader and a worship team who would say, no, God, give me eyes to see what you see and would redirect a, a worship rehearsal knowing, knowing that on Sunday morning at this point, they are going to be leading more than a 1,000 adults in this room every week in worship. And that's a weighty responsibility. And yet that they're willing to say, even though we have to prepare to lead more than a 1,000 adults in worship on Sunday, right now, God's called us to lead one in worship. And so right there in that moment, they led one gentleman in worship to the Lord Jesus. And then later that evening, Jordan ended up giving the gentleman a ride home. And he was explaining to Jordan he can't go back to his house. You see, he was serious when he was renouncing his faith. And he said, I, I can't go there anymore. I won't be welcomed. I won't be accepted. And so he had Jordan take him to another place that he knew he could go instead because he could not go home anymore. You see, this, this gentleman found the kingdom of God that day and he was willing to lose it all, to give up everything else for what he gained. You see, he, he found the treasure in the field. Can I, can I just tell you how long I have specifically prayed that this church would be able to reach our Muslim brothers and sisters in this neighborhood, our, our Muslim neighbors and friends in this neighborhood, and, and bring them to the truth of the gospel? And, and now, literally, they're just, God's just bringing them. Like, they're just walking across the parking lot. They're just showing up here and knocking on the door. And, I, and I'm so thankful that we, ha we have a team of people who are, are willing to say, you know what, if we're going to pray that God would give us an open door, then we're not going to keep the door closed when they show up. And we're, we're going to open the door and we're going to say, come on in. And this isn't our plan. This isn't what we expected. This isn't what we thought we were going to be doing today. Are you willing to be interrupted and disrupted in your life for the kingdom of heaven to show up in your midst? This man found the kingdom of heaven that day. But also, can I, can I just encourage you, so did our team. So did our team. They could have missed it, but they were willing to listen to the voice of Jesus, to be surrendered to the Holy Spirit, and be willing to say, whatever you have, 
God, you can, you can have it all. So here, here's how we're going to close our, our time today. Our, our team is going to come back out, and they're going to lead us in one last song. This is a, a song, actually, believe it or not, that Jordan Applegate himself wrote. It's a song that we've sang many times in, in this church body, and it's just a song that says, you can have it all. And I just want to encourage you, as we're singing this song, to pray and ask the Holy Spirit, what, what do you still need to surrender? What do you still need to give over? What, what do you need to give back to God? What do you need to give to him for the very first time? What is he calling you to let go of so that you can receive the kingdom of heaven? And as we sing the song, I'm going to ask for our prayer team and our elders to make their way down to the front of the stage and just be available for prayer. And if you're in this room and you need prayer for any reason, listen, sin and shame have no hold on you anymore. We're going to declare that in this song. And no matter what it is, maybe, maybe it's just a, an area of your life that you need to surrender, or maybe it's just a struggle that you're walking through, maybe it's a difficulty that you just need somebody to come alongside you and pray, may this be a house of prayer today as we're singing and responding and worshiping and surrendering it all back to Jesus. So I'm going to pray for us at this time. I'm going to ask you to stand if you would. And as I'm praying, if our prayer team can get in place as well, and then we will worship together. Jesus, we we thank you for what you're doing in this place. We thank you that the story that I shared today is not just that man's story, it's all of our stories. That you found us when we were hopeless and helpless. That you rescued us, redeemed us, and restored us when we didn't deserve it. That you gave it all for us. And that you've invited us to receive the kingdom of heaven. God, I pray that you would help us to see the kingdom of heaven is in our midst, that it's all around us. I pray that you would give us a heart for for the people in our neighborhoods, in our community, all around us who are so far from you, that you would help us to, to see them as you do. Jesus, you died on the cross for them too. And God, I pray for any person who's in this place today who's still experiencing some, some shame, guilt, or just struggle in any way that that today would be the day that the chains are broken free. That they find freedom in you, new life in you. They find hope in you, forgiveness in you, Jesus. That they find the treasure, that they find the pearl, that they find the kingdom today. We pray this all in your name. We ask you to have your way. In Jesus' name.